this is a topic that, needless to say, I'm super excited about. Uh, so it's always fun to, to tell more people about it. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm CEO of Traptics. We're doing uh, farming robots, starting with strawberry picking machines. Um, and you guys, uh, during the talk, feel free to interrupt with questions at any time. Um, also, I'm on Twitter, so you guys should follow me. And you should tweet at me if you have questions you don't want to ask now. Um, I'm trying out this Twitter thing. Uh, or, or send me an email. So basically, this is about robotic farming. Um, so there's this serious labor crisis um, that's threatening our agricultural system. Um, and robots are the answer. So I'm going to talk to you about that. So if you look at the way wheat was harvested 200 years ago, it was all done by hand. A bunch of people out in the field with hand tools, like physically doing all the things. And nowadays, we use these giant machines. They're very fast and efficient. They harvest an incredible volume. Um, but they don't work on most fruits and vegetables because they lack the delicacy and the precision necessary to harvest these crops. Um, and this is a problem for a few reasons. So first of all, there's a serious labor shortage. Um, if you look at, at strawberries, for example, uh, something like 20% of strawberries go unharvested every year because the farmers can't find enough people to harvest the crops. So strawberries literally being left to rot in the fields. At the same time, the, the, the growers also want to grow a lot more strawberries, but they can't because they can't find enough labor. Um, and this is a problem that's been um, really hitting crisis levels in the last couple of years, uh, due in large part to immigration. So uh, most of the picking workforce are undocumented immigrants. And that population of undocumented immigrants that these growers are reliant on um, has been shrinking over the past 10 years. And that's expected to get a lot worse going forward with changing immigration policy. At the same time, uh, the labor that they can find is super expensive. So the, the cost of harvesting an acre of strawberries is about $12,000 an acre over the course of the season. Uh, it's the single largest cost. It counts for about 30% of the total cost. And this is true not just of strawberries, but of pretty much all the fruits and vegetables that are harvested by hand. That the, the harvest labor is uh, the largest cost of growing. Um, and there's also... Yes. Is that representative of most crops? Um, I guess by various categories, like vegetables, fruits, row crops, etc. So it does not apply to row crops. So row crops like wheat, corn, soybeans, etc. are um, fully automated. And for them, the, the cost of harvest is extremely low. It's a very small percentage of the total cost of producing the crops, um, which makes these crops as a whole much cheaper and allows us to produce them in enormous volume, which is part of what we need to be able to do with fruits and vegetables. Sorry, so is this representative then of like lettuce or broccoli or nectarines or? Yeah, so, so pretty much all fresh fruits and vegetables, so things you'd buy in a grocery store, um, pretty much all that is harvested by hand. Um, this does not really apply to nuts, but fruits and vegetables, uh, pretty much all of them are harvested by hand. If you look at processing... Is something like 30% is the cost, or...? Yeah, 30% of the... Like, strawberries are the highest, and that's what you're doing first. Uh, strawberries are somewhat above average, but they're still sort of in the, the normal range. Um, this obviously does not apply to uh, processing applications. So if you buy, like, apple cider or something, uh, the apples were put into that, uh, there's a good chance those were harvested mechanically. But anything you buy in a grocery store that's you know, high quality, um, delicate, um, so including lettuce and these other things. Yeah. Um, question? I have a question. Um, it's $12,000 to harvest an acre. Um, can you put that in the units and understand do you, like, do you have a sense for how much that is for strawberries, for example, or for tons of strawberries, or how many tons of strawberries get under that? Yeah. Um, well, it's about a third of the cost of the strawberry. Yeah, so, so it's going to be about a third of the cost uh, that the grower pays to produce a strawberry. Um, if you look at like buying strawberries in a grocery store, there's also additional markup there. Uh, so it's not necessarily a third of the grocery store cost. Um, it might be less. It might be like 10% or, or a little bit less than that. Um, the, the final aspect of the cost, too, is that uh, there's a couple laws that are going to continue to increase the cost. Uh, so one is mandatory overtime pay for farm workers, and the other is a higher minimum wage in California. Uh, since California grows about um, half the nation's fruits and vegetables, this is uh, uh, definitely an important issue. Um, not necessarily a bad thing that we're passing these laws. It's probably a good thing overall, um, but definitely relevant economically. And finally, um, there's, uh, the humans tend to pack the boxes um, inefficiently. So they put um, an inconsistent number of berries in each box. Uh, there's also some other issues around uh, food safety and cleanliness. If you have the workers out in the field physically touching the fruit, which they do now, um, then if they're not washing their hands, that can be a concern. So there's some other ancillary issues around uh, this, this human labor. Um, so, and there's, there's been a number of technological changes that have given us the ability to solve this um, as of like the last two or three years. So one of the, the things is improving sensors. So 
3D cameras in particular have gotten a lot better in the last five or 10 years, which means that we now have the ability to put a relatively cheap sensor in a machine that can um, understand the fields well enough that we can pick, pick using it. At the same time, um, computing power has gotten a lot cheaper, which allows us to do, to do deep learning. So we have these really um, advanced intelligence techniques that we can use to um, understand the field in a really flexible and powerful way, um, which makes this a lot easier. And then finally, um, on the actuator side, um, if you look at these robot arms, so uh, like this is an example of a robot arm that we use. 10 years ago, it would have been twice as expensive and it would have weighed almost six times as much. So making these a lot lighter um, and a lot cheaper makes the economics of this a lot better. It's one of the keys here is that um, there is now a situation where we can solve this problem with robotics in an economical way, whereas 10 years ago, um, we couldn't. Um, Um, I think the biggest thing is a demand, the, the biggest thing that's driving the cost of these down is um, a demand for lightweight, low-cost robots in factories. Uh, I think demand for, for more of these in packing facilities and stuff. Um, yeah, the, these are all produced in really low volume. So a machine like that, if, like, if they produce a much higher volume, it would be a lot cheaper. Um, so sort of like if the volume of the, if the demand increases, uh, they'll get a lot cheaper. There's also room for this to come down a lot more. So one of these is like $22,000. Um, could probably be produced for a fraction of that if there's high enough demand for it. Um, so in terms of what's hard about this, uh, about using robotics to harvest crops, uh, a big aspect of this is manipulation. So um, in order to, to get um, the fruit of the vegetables off the plant, there's usually some fairly complicated things you need to do. Like with strawberries, for example, you need to grasp the strawberry and be able to pull it hard enough to break the stem. That requires about 20 times as much force as it takes to pick up the berry. So you have to be able to apply a lot of force um, while rotating the berry at 90 degrees and also being very delicate so you don't damage it. When um, you look at other fruits, like sometimes you have to twist them to pull them off the plant or you have to bend them or cut them. So there's some, some challenging um, aspects to just um, working with the, the fruit of the vegetable. Um, at the same time, you need to be able to grab these crops in a situation where there might be other fruit touching it that you don't want to disturb. So if there's two berries touching each other, you want to be able to pick one of them without picking the other. Um, and obviously, so being delicate and then having enough longevity in your manipulation that um, you can pick a whole bunch of these, um, which allows you to be economical. Um, there's like a, a wide variety of sizes and shapes within like specific fruits and vegetables and then just across the whole. Uh, industry. At the same time, uh, perception is challenging. So uh, this is sort of a close-up image of the plant, of, of a strawberry plant. So you need to be able to identify the fruit you want to pick um, well enough to tell which fruit you pick and which fruit you ignore. Uh, at the same time, you, you usually need to be able to understand the um, structure of the plant um, in a way that informs the, the way that you do the pick. Um, so sometimes if there's stuff in the way of the, the fruit or the vegetable that you need to and navigate around, or you know, if the angle that you're picking at is, is influenced by the shape of the plant around it. Um, so you have to be able to understand all these things um, from, from an image of it, usually a, a 3D image. Um, and so the, that kind of software stack is reasonably challenging. Um, and then the, the final thing is you need a level of robustness that you don't see in many other industries. So when you put these machines out in the field, they basically need to be able to run for 24, 24 hours a day uh, for months on end with, with minimal maintenance. And this is a situation where the users are not very tech savvy, so um, they're going to be pretty rough with them. Uh, it needs to handle vibration and dust, um, potential rain or, or water splashing up from the ground. You need to be able to handle wind. Um, and you obviously need to be able to last a long time in order for the economics to work out. Uh, so it's challenging to take these um, potentially sensitive electronics, the 3D cameras, the you know, graphics cars, and the other things, and, and put them out in this really dirty environment so that you can um, can meet the needs of this industry. Um, so that's sort of like at a high level uh, the different challenges uh, that we see um, for doing agricultural robots and far farming robots in general. Um, in terms of how this fits into larger trends, um, what we've seen um, not just in the last few years but in the last like 200 years is that um, the future of work really is, is more automation. Um, so the, the question is how do we, for a given hour of human labor, how do we get more done with that? 
Um, you, know, you see it in agriculture first with um, switching from hand tools to things drawn by horses to things attached to tractors and specialized tools. It's not th just that. It's also that like, if you think about the way memos used to be delivered, it used to be someone dictating verbally a note to someone, and then someone else would write it down and like, physically hand it out to a bunch of different people in the office. And now we use um, computers and the internet for that. Um, at the same time, similar things with spreadsheets, where it used to be people that physically wrote down all the, the grid of numbers um, for counting, and now we have software that does that a lot better. Um, uh, car factories and warehouses have become uh, far more automated. And even like with container ships, I really want to put a picture of a container ship because I think they're really cool. Um, but the idea there is like we've made container ships very large so that you know, for a, kind of a fixed crew size, we can transport a lot more stuff. So you're getting more done with each hour of labor. Um, and that's something you're seeing across all industries, and it's something really that's critical to um, allowing our society to function the way it does. Uh, with relatively cheap consumer goods and um, you know, much higher quality of living than what you saw maybe 100 or 200 years ago. Um, the obvious uh, question that comes after that is, is sort of, is what about the jobs? You know, so if, you're, if you have a job that's being done by a human and you put a machine out that does the same thing, you know, how does that affect the total workforce? Um, so the, the answer that's most relevant for us in agriculture, first of all, is that there's such a serious labor shortage that even as, as we automate um, a large percentage of what they're doing, um, the total workforce will still stay, stay the same. There's still enough demand for that labor in, in other areas of agriculture that doesn't really change that. At the same time, many of these growers want to grow more crops. They want to plant, uh, they've, we've, we've been told that our, our growers want to plant 30% more acres of strawberries, uh, but they can't because they can't find enough human labor. So if we can automate a lot of that, they can plant um, more crops, which increases the demand for labor and all the other aspects of the growing cycle. So people that shape the field and do the planning and drive the tractors year round and do plant health and weeding and, and other stuff like that. So there's a lot more demand for labor kind of in the other areas, um, which is a way that you can actually see the total demand for labor increase as you automate. And at the same time, a lot of these other jobs that people uh, will do um, are much higher quality jobs. So picking strawberries is like probably the worst, one of the worst jobs you can possibly do. because you're literally like bent over picking stuff up off the ground for eight or 10 hours a day, um, every day for months on end. So it's extremely destructive to people's bodies. Basically, this is a job nobody wants to do. Um, and if we can convert some of those jobs to jobs where people drive tractors, um, people are sitting in an air-conditioned um, cab in kind of a, a comfortable and safe position, um, that's really gonna improve the quality of life of the people working on these farms. Um, and that's sort of one of the, the promises of automation in general, is that you can automate the, the worst aspects of people's jobs and allow them to focus their time on doing better stuff. If you improve the productivity for each person, um, then there's, uh, it's, it's easier to pay them more as well. Um, and then moving on to like more general social impact. Um, something that I think people in this area don't think about as much is that like, so like, if you think about the amount of your income that you spend on food, it's, it's probably relatively low. Um, you know, people in the top 20% of income in the US spend about five to 10% of their income on food. So food prices are not a, a huge concern, um, especially to people in this area. But if you look at um, the, the bottom 20% of um, income earners in the US, uh, you see that they tend to spend um, 30 to 35% of their income on food. So um, you know, people are spending a lot more money on food um, at lower incomes. Um, and so if you can make that cheaper, uh, if you can reduce the cost of this food, you, you really um, alleviate a lot of the financial difficulty that these people are, are facing. And you also, if you can make the fruits and vegetables cheaper, these are really high quality, healthy things that the people want to eat. If you can make that cheaper, you can allow people to eat a lot more of this and therefore have better lives. Um, so um, first of all, like reducing the cost of that is super important. This also um, increases prosperity in general. Um, there's, it means if we can grow more crops, there's, there's more total wealth in the country, which is, um, at a, at a high level, should be a good thing, um, as long as you distribute that properly. Um, so kind of the last um, piece of this is what do you do with all that additional wealth you've created? Um, some of it naturally goes to um, sort of the average person in, in terms of cheaper crops and consumer goods and an increased availability of these things that people want. Uh, but at the same time, um, you see a disproportion, a share of it going towards uh, the people that own the capital, so people like you know making the companies and 
um, stuff like that. So uh, we need to keep in mind that uh, increasing the, the top marginal tax rate will alleviate some of that social inequality. And we can use that on job retraining support to help people adapt to these changing things and potentially universal basic income or other things that help uh, people in these groups. Um, okay, so um, the last thing I want to say is that we are hiring. So if this sounds like an interesting problem to work on, uh, you should come join us. So there's currently three of us and we are expanding. So we're looking for people with robotics skills, uh, software skills, especially in computer vision or machine learning, um, and then also uh, mechanical engineering expertise, especially in industrial applications. Um, so if that sounds like fun, uh, you should send me an email. Um, and uh, at this point, um, over for questions. Yes. I did go farming last year, and I found it to be a really fun experience, but then I only did it for a few weeks, so didn't have the backaches that you're mentioning. Um, but I'm curious, when you... Um, have you guys measured the rate of how many strawberries a human can pick versus your machine per hour? Yeah. Um, so it's... it's the, in terms of the speed at which humans pick berries, it's pretty variable. Um, so you, you can see humans uh, pick in bursts of like two strawberries per second, which is quite fast. Um, but humans also, so, so the human will be out in the field uh, picking berries into a box. Um, and they'll have to close the box and carry it back to a central location and get a new one. Um, so, so the human pickers can spend um, up to 50% of their time just walking between the field and kind of the central location. Uh, I think that overall, humans probably average uh, one and a half seconds per berry kind of over the course of a, an eight or a 10 hour shift. Um, we are building a machine that will have six robot arms and each robot arm we expect to pick a berry every 0.8 seconds or so. So it'll be substantially faster. How do you get a 3D image or 3D vision? Yes, yeah, so we're currently using uh, the latest generation. So to get that 3D image, we're currently using a latest generation Kinect. Um, so it gives us, the, the death map comes from a, a time of flight sensor and a um, has a, a color image. It's also um, mapped to the, the depth image. Um, and so it gives us a, a really accurate and, and dense point cloud uh, of the scene we're looking at. I'm curious if there are any particular challenges with strawberries versus other, um, other fruits and vegetables that, are, that have this delicate problem. Yeah, so in terms of the, the challenges in strawberries versus other crops, uh, strawberries are one of the more delicate crops. Um, so the manipulation challenge in strawberries is somewhat harder than uh, a lot of these other fruits and vegetables. Um, I think the, like the fun fundamental economic labor concerns um, are the same across uh, most of these fruits and vegetables. Uh, and on the technical side, it's sort of a mix of like, um, like what's the, the plant shape? So like strawberries are relatively low to the ground. So with a relatively small robot arm and gripper, we can, um, we can do that. Um, if you have like, like peaches or lemons or something that's in a taller tree, you might need a much larger machine to get to it. Um, so there's some like kind of uh, more minor differences. I think the fundamental like delicacy and firmness challenges are probably similar across many of these crops. I'm just curious if you have a video or a, to, to show us of it in action. Not today, unfortunately. Soon though. So you, you, had, you mentioned three uh, challenges at a high level. Uh, which which one has been like the hardest and also like how, how did you approach in solving them like you just kind of solve the hardest one first or um yeah so in terms of the three challenges of the the manipulation the perception and the robustness um i think the manipulation was the hardest challenge um it was especially the one that we were the least sure that we could solve uh so when we, when we started working on this um we had this belief that this was possible to do but Nobody had really proven that it was possible yet. Um, and I think the manipulation was the one definitely that we were most skeptical about. Um, so we did start trying to work on that first. Um, and one of the keys there was uh, being able to get a really fast iteration time on that. Um, so we use 3D printers for uh, basically everything, which allows us to, but by doing it in-house with these 3D printers, we can get a really fast cycle time, especially on the mechanical stuff. So we have a, a cycle time on mechanical changes that like sort of start to approach what you might see in software, um, which is something that wasn't the case, you know, 10 years ago. Um, in terms of did we start let, solve that first? Uh, we sort of solved it in parallel with other things. Uh, the other aspect of this was um, 
kind of worked on the software stack the whole time. Um, and by getting a, a really good um, lab, lab testing environment for that, we were able to uh, do relatively well uh, in terms of like a pace of development. Did you take the approach of like when it comes to manipulation, kind of like mimicking human approach or like just kind of forget that and come, come up with like a mechanical approach that's completely different? Uh, we tried to cast a pretty wide net. I think actually like our, our first approach was sort of somewhat inspired by human hand. Um, but like the approach we settled on was a little bit less so. If we can't see a video, can you tell us how far along you are? Does it pick strawberries yet? Yeah. How close are you to market? Yeah, so, um, so we basically, we've built three generations of prototypes so far. Um, so we did like our, our first generation prototype um, last summer, which is an, a really small scale um, experiment with doing vision and robotics in the field. So we had a, a, a Z stereo camera and we bought this like $200 six axis robot arm on e or, uh, um, online, um, which was like really bad, but it, it, was, it was good for experimentation. Um, and then we uh, expanded to our, our second generation prototype where we bought a used robot arm on eBay. Uh, we bought a, a SCAR arm that I believe sat in a 3M factory for like 10 years. Um, and then someone, you know, they sold it off and someone shipped it to us. And so we used that. We had a much larger uh, frame that we built out of 8020, which is like this, these really cool aluminum tubes. Um, and then uh, did our third generation prototype, which used uh, the same arm that we'll use for our production model, um, which was the one I was talking about um, several slides ago. Um, and with that one, we, we can now successfully pick strawberries. So we have demonstrated it in the field uh, in Watsonville, which is about an hour away, doing fully automated pick cycles um, in a, a real commercial strawberry farm. Um, and so the next step is, uh, so our, our fourth generation machine um, will get us to a paid field trial. So um, starting work on that now. Uh, I'm curious if you see um, the future as, uh, or like your future, like say short term, like next few years, as having a specialized um, robot for per crop, or having um, more general capabilities uh, as like a f farmhand. Yeah. Um, so in terms of like, do we focus on? just harvesting and just strawberries versus lots of other activities and crops. Um, a lot of that is driven by the, the economics of the situation. So when we look at the market size as a whole, um, approximately $700 million are spent each year in the US on manual labor for strawberry harvest. So just harvest activities, just strawberries, and $700 million. So that's uh, a really great market to start in. Um, and so our initial focus for the next year or two um, is just solving harvest of strawberries. I want to focus just on that activity, a relatively specialized machine that does really well at that. Um, as we become successful there, um, we, I think we, we'll definitely expand to other crops and activities because we're, we're, we're much more excited about the idea of changing the way farming is done on a large scale. Um, we want to impact the, the um, US and the worldwide food production system uh, in, a, in a much stronger way. Um, which means expanding to lots of crops and activities. And a key part there is making sure that we can share as much as possible across one machine or, or across different crops. Um, so if we have to you know, start over from scratch for each additional crop, it's relatively hard to scale efficiently. Um, but if we can share a lot of this stuff, um, which I think we can, um, then we'll be able to expand uh, a lot more quickly. What were the biggest challenges around quality? So like crushing the strawberries, picking unripe strawberries, and then how did you kind of overcome them? Like I can think of like a training model. Did you have someone eating the strawberries and then saying like this, was, this wasn't this was ripe enough? <laughs> right? How did you think about kind of those quality like and then overcome the challenges around that? There was definitely a lot of eating strawberries. Um, <laughs> I have consumed a lot more strawberries in the past year and a half than uh, probably the rest of my life combined. Um, so that's a really positive outcome of, of doing this. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Um, so one of the things that we did, which I think was really valuable, is when we looked at solving each of these problems, we tried to break them down into uh, individual components. We tried to focus on solving each component separately. Um, so for example, training the ripeness detector. Um, so uh, I was working at Microsoft before I left to do this. Um, and I started talking to strawberry farmers um, before leaving my previous job. So I want to get an understanding for um, 
like what do they view the, their top concerns as? What are their top business concerns? Uh, and first of all, they, they all identified the, the labor crisis as their number one business concern. They, they saw it as an existential threat to the business. So that was a really great sign that this was a good thing to do. We tried to kind of start with that market before building the technology. Uh, and the second thing is I wanted to make sure that there was enough support in the industry for this. Like not only that they recognize it's a problem, but that they're willing to help people solve it. And so uh, I went to several different, um, several of the largest growers and, and asked for um, opportunities to test in their field and, and they agreed to do that. So they agreed to give us a lot of access to their fields for, for data gathering and for prototype testing. So um, kind of from that, some of those initial meetings, I, was, um, I would talk to them and I'd also walk through the field with um, cameras uh, taking uh, images and video. Um, so we have images and video from um, a bunch of different farms at different months of the year with different varieties of plants and different field configurations. And so by the time we actually started working on the latest version of the software, we had this really great data set built up. Um, so uh, we could use that to, to label the ripe strawberries and use that as the input uh, to, to train our machine learning, um, which is super helpful. Um, and then kind of on the manipulation side, um, doing lots of, of tests where we do an iteration of, of our grass bird, we take it to a field and we'd use it to pick berries and then we'd see what the quality was um, via a, a variety of methods. So really being able to understand the, the performance of like each aspect of the system individually, um, kind of before we run it as a whole, before we ran it as a whole, that was uh, really valuable. It also allowed us to, to move quickly. Um, so I assume you didn't do anything related to strawberries at Microsoft. So how That's did correct. you? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. So how, how did you end up building or uh, building a robotics company in in, in farming? And also, uh, what are like the biggest lessons learned doing that? You know, that you wish you knew. Yeah. So um, yeah, at Microsoft has working on PowerPoint, like the the product. <laughs> <laughs> so I used some of the code I wrote when I was making this deck. Um, in terms of how we got into strawberries, um, so I have known for a long time, I, I've always thought robots were awesome. Um, I've been disappointed, especially in the last like five or 10 years by how few robots there are in the world. I think when I was a kid, I had this vision of the future as like robots being everywhere and like all the bad tasks that you don't want to do, like folding laundry and stuff, that robots would just do these. Um, and sort of more recently, I realized that like, okay, well maybe I should go try to solve this problem. So I started looking around for different opportunities to apply robots to. So I looked at a bunch of different industries. Um, and once I discovered the labor crisis in agriculture, it seemed pretty clear that, that this is um, a, an amazing uh, business case for, for robots. So the business case is super obvious. There's a ton of support from the industry. Um, and furthermore, the activities that people are doing are, are relatively well understood. You know, there's not a lot of like complex customer interactions or something. It's just relatively straightforward activity. So it's easy to go into a farm and watch someone do this activity and understand how it works. So it's a situation where the business case was super obvious um, and the technical, technical challenge was hard, uh, which I think is like um, sort of the perfect uh, startup opportunity, um, especially for me. Um, in terms of like how, how we got the skills to work on this, uh, so there's currently um, three of us working on this. Um, and we met um, in college at UC San Diego and we were working on an autonomous airplane team. Um, so we were competing in a student, uh, as AVSI, so we were competing in a student competition to build and fly an airplane that did an aerial surveillance challenge. So we were, we were building an airframe, designing onboard electronics, writing computer vision software that did autonomous target detection, uh, and some ground control software. Um, and so we, we worked really closely together in this for, for three or four years, which had a couple benefits. Uh, the first was that we learned a lot of the skills we need for this. So it turns out um, doing drones is relatively similar to doing robots in terms of there's this combined hardware and software challenge. You need the the whole stack to work really well together. You also have these, um, this hardware and software that's operating outdoors in this dirty, messy environment with a, a lot of variability. Um, and the other uh, um, benefit to this is that um, we worked really well together. So we kind of knew each other and uh, liked each other. And that was great for the first, um, you know, the first, first sort of year of this. What did I not know about agriculture? I knew nothing about agriculture. Um, I was sort of reading about it. I was like, huh, that might be a good thing. I wonder what it's like to be on a farm. Um, so I, like, honestly, I just started, like, cold emailing people um, in, like, like, different farmers and different people in the industry and going to, like, agriculture technology meetups and trying to understand, like, what this was all about. 
Um, I met some really awesome people that like took me to farms and like and I got to see firsthand what is this like. Um, so in terms of how I learned about the industry, it was a combination of doing um, like high level economic research. So the US Department of Agriculture has incredibly detailed data about um, the US agriculture system, like you know, how much is produced of, of various crops and like what the cost inputs are. And so I was able to get a really uh, solid idea of where money was spent um, in agriculture, which is really key to allowing this to work. Um, so I knew that not only did they want this solution, but also they were already, the, the growers were already paying an enormous amount of money for the labor. Um, so they're definitely willing to pay for this. So it's key to nailing down the business case. Um, and then a part of it was just uh, when I would go and talk to the growers, um, trying to um, you know, ask a lot of like, kind of open-ended questions that would allow them to like, so that they could teach me um, what their business was like and what it was like you know, on a day-to-day -day environment for them and like, what it was like being on a farm and like how to um, kind of like, so that I could get an understanding for, so we, we could get an understanding for how do we build a machine that will fit into this environment really well. So part of it was just um, trying to be super, super open um, to like learning from the customers so that they could teach us how agriculture works. And a question about the, the economics. You had mentioned that there's a labor shortage <clears throat> and so that there's likely even with this technology uh, to still be the same you know amount of labor in agriculture is what what is the long term outcome for that then does that so if we have improved technology and the same amount of labor does that mean we 're just producing more food and people are eating more or does that mean switching to harder to produce foods like maybe more strawberries and fewer grapes or, or something like that yeah, so in terms of um, what 's the long term outcome of automating this stuff um, so there's a couple aspects of this. The first is that the, the amount of labor, like the, the supply of labor, the, the quantity of people that want to do these jobs or really are willing to do these jobs um, is declining. Um, so, so like 10 years from now, there aren't going to be the same number of farm workers. There's going to be a lot fewer. So in one sense, um, the, doing rapid um, mechanization of these activities is necessary just to keep up, just to allow us to continue producing the same things we're producing now. Um, so that's like the first step. Uh, the second step is... Um, definitely um, higher production and therefore higher consumption of uh, these manually harvested crops. Um, so fruits and vegetables will be consumed a lot more. So it's not like people will necessarily be eating more calories in general, but they'll probably be eating fruits and vegetables in a situation where they would have been eating um, maybe less healthy or lower quality food. So maybe replacing some like wheat and corn with like strawberries or, or peaches or lettuce or something. Um, which is good for health and also for happiness, I think. Supposedly, fruits and vegetables today have something like a quarter or an eighth as many nutrients as they did 100 years ago due to soil nutrient depletion. Will increasing the yields that this is allowing make that just worse, or do you have a way to make that better? Um, so I'm not super familiar with uh, like the nutrient contents specifically, but the, the one interesting thing here is because we're... Um, running this really high resolution 3D camera over the field, um, especially in strawberries, they're harvested every three days, so we're running this over and over and over. Uh, we can gather this really detailed data about the yield uh, and plant health and other things like that, and we can use it to educate the grower so that they have a better idea of what's going on in their field and so that they can um, improve the quality of their field on a really granular level. Like currently, they'll, they'll walk out into their field and they might inspect like small parts of it and make decisions about, okay, how much should I water my whole field tomorrow? And then they'll decide, okay, I'm gonna you know, literally water the whole field a little bit more, a little bit less. But if you have really detailed data about, like, how is, this, how is each specific plant doing, and then you can maybe operate on individual plants, you can really improve the, the yield and potentially the quality of the crops as well. I was wondering, did you talk to both small and large farmers, and uh, do you think there might be a negative effect on this, on centralization of farming and um, scalability? Yeah, in terms of small versus large farmers and how this affects that, um, from the research that we've done, uh, I think like strawberry farms are definitely smaller than like say wheat or corn or soybean farms. Um, so the the problems maybe or the yeah that, that kind of factor isn't quite as severe with um, fruits and vegetables. Um, there is likely to be um, kind of a, a a minimum farm size that's necessary for using a machine like ours, um, where if you have a farm that's too small, it's just not going to be able to fully utilize the, 
the machines that we would build. Um, currently, uh, it seems to be the case that 80 to 90 percent of strawberries are grown on farms um, large enough to make full utilization of one of our machines. Um, so it sort of wouldn't be too much of an issue there. Um, and then the very small percentage of strawberries are going on farms smaller than that. Um, I think there's already a lot of economic pressure for you know, those, farm, those farms to be larger. Um, what made strawberries like the right market over like beans or grapes or whatever to go into as like the first? Yeah, um, aside from the fact that they're delicious, um, which was uh, a prerequisite, uh, but not the reason. Um, we went after strawberries because they're the, um, the most valuable crop in California that's not automated yet. So we looked at what's the total spend on harvest labor across all the crops in California. Uh, and strawberries were, um, I believe, second on that list. I think uh, pruning and thinning of wine grapes was the largest activity. Um, and we wanted to stay in California just because it's, it's really nice to be geographically close to, um, to your market. Like we can uh, put our machine in a trailer and, and drive it an hour down to the, the farms in the summer or if you're four or five hours in the winter. Um, and so that's, that's really useful. At the same time, um, strawberries are harvested every month of the year in California. So even though a particular farm only harvests for about five months, um, there are farms in Northern California that harvest in the summer months and Southern California that harvest in the winter and some farms in the middle. So we have some opportunities to, to test the machine every month of the year um, in the short term and then long term get high machine utilization and recurring revenue. Uh, so it's really like the, the perfect market um, to start in. There's also um, small and low to the ground, so we could use slightly smaller robots, which was nice for like just us like working with them and then also the cost. Um, are there any products or services that you wish that existed? that would have helped you kind of like focus on you know solving the core problem um as opposed to solving a problem that like that's probably relevant to like a ton of other robotics companies for example yeah um in terms of what i wish existed um our initial plan was to use an off-the-shelf gripper um so we expect that we could just go out and buy an existing gripper and that that would work um so i sort of wish one had existed because if, if it had we'd probably like be in market right now um that's one thing. Um, I think that the robot arms that we use uh, could be a lot cheaper um, and lighter. Um, and also they're optimized a little bit too much for like extreme precision and not quite enough for like being cheap and light. Uh, so there's definitely some room there. The robot arms aren't quite optimal for our application. Um, those are probably the, the top things that come to mind. The software side, uh, let's see. I, I think the like the open source software that's available for like computer vision, AI, deep learning, and stuff has gotten pretty amazing. Um, so I was really impressed by how quickly we're able to like take advantage of these existing things and make progress. Uh, so I was pretty happy with that. Um, like if someone. Um, Probably deep learning. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's pretty popular today, so I'm not going to say anything groundbreaking on that front, except that like, I, was just, I was surprised by um, how quickly I could build a component that would, that would identify ripe strawberries. Um, like, it took me a while to gather the data and to label, but once I did, it was relatively easy to build a network that could, um, that could solve the problem at an acceptable level of accuracy. Uh, cafe? Um, it's currently, yeah, we started off with a, a, a lot of Python code and like a little bit of C++. We moved almost everything to C++ uh, except for our machine, except for the neural network, which is still Python. So that's actually like, yeah, but it's, it's important. I'm sure there's been a lot of academic work in robots in the last like few decades. Do you use much academic work? Or you sort of think from first principles about how to grab a strawberry and sort of more like you thinking sort of new? Yeah, in terms of like using the existing research versus new stuff, we do try to think a lot more from first principles. Um, we try to think really hard about what is this exact problem that we're solving and what's the best way to do it. Um, I think that uh, research, especially in the robotics area, has been, over the last like 10 or 20 years, has been um, too focused on like 
pure research stuff and not, a, not focus enough on commercializing things. Like people might spend a lot of time thinking about, okay, how do I develop a grasper that like, can grab any type of object with like, no limitations, and how do I like, do all the math computation to figure that out, rather than like, solving it for like, a specific class of object and getting something actually out into market. Um, so we tried, to, like, we tried to be inspired by the research that existed, um, definitely, but I think mostly we thought from first principles, um, both on the hardware and the software side. Were there deep learning algorithms from research that you were able to start with and iterate on, or did you have to come up with those yourself? Um, like, so, yeah, for example, ResNet, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we based ours on faster RCNN. Um, and it's not just because it were, there were Microsoft researchers that came up with it. Yeah, you talk about your vision of, or uh, annoyance that there aren't more robots in the world. Uh, I guess the big picture thing I'm trying to get out of your talk other than that I want a strawberry, is that, uh, like, is that the reality going forward? <laughs> uh, are you sort of a sign of an impending wave of um, detailed manipulation robots in uh, outdoor environments? Uh, or, or is there really something special about your technology or strawberries or something like that? I think in some senses it's inevitable. Um, there's just such an enormous um, market need for this. Um, and also, like, the, the technology has gotten better enough that people can now do this. Um, so, like, like, if you look at the, the overall trend towards automation, not just in agriculture, but in other things, it, it does make it seem awfully inevitable that this is just guaranteed to happen. Um, that being said, I, I think a lot of the, like, little, like, 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 little pieces of, Autom automation revolution that's happening inside that larger trend. I think those happen because like a group of people get together and they they say, okay, we're gonna solve this and they work really hard and they're clever and they come up with solutions to it. So like maybe looking at like a like a macro perspective makes it seem too inevitable. Um, I think that like you have to there have to be people that go out and solve these problems. Um, so and like I think that if we didn't do strawberries it would be at least a while before someone else did. Yeah, on uh, uh, on the, that same question, like, what's the sort of the competition like? You know, are there a ton of companies building robots to do this kind of things? It's got to be a highly visible problem. And yeah, so if you look at um, if you look at agriculture as a whole, um, there's some companies that have been successful. Uh, like Blue River is a good example. They're doing um, a lot of thinning and weeding, and they've encountered a lot of success with that. Um, so they're definitely a big inspiration for us, showing that it's possible to, to build a company that builds like these really intelligent machines um, for agriculture, and that it's possible to get funded and to be successful in the market and, and all this stuff. Uh, lettuce thinning and then uh, weeding also. Um, in terms of like, like if you look just at strawberries, uh, there's a few other companies trying to go after this. Um, and one of the, the key, um, that's right way to say this, the key um, questions in automation is um, how much do you change, like do you make a machine that can pick strawberries if you assume that the strawberries are grown exactly the same, you know, five years from now as they are now? Uh, or do you try to change the growing method to match the automation? If you look at the way tomatoes were automated um, like 30 or 40 years ago, they, they went to a completely different variety of tomato and they built a machine that could automate, automatically harvest those. Um, and so I think some groups are, are trying to, to figure out, okay, how do we change the growing system? Uh, the, the, the issue there is you uh, can really negatively impact yield um, of the plants and make it cost a lot more to grow that way. Uh, you also have this huge barrier to entry for the customers. Um, so we're firmly on the side of, we want to be able to harvest in normal strawberry fields as is. We want to be able to throw our machine out in the middle of a harvest season. Um, we want to be able to meet a grower and throw our machine out the next week, give them a free trial, and it should just work. That way there's, there's super low barrier to entry for um, all the customers, um, so we, which allows us to scale more quickly. It also allows us to keep uh, this, this growing system that's been really well optimized for cost and yield. It allows us to continue to use that. And, and, man, and maintain those benefits. Cool. Thank you.